Well, I'm now to Beijing. Our bureau chief, Stephen Jiang, is standing by, joins us live. So, Stephen, uh, you know, these sort of face-to-face -face meetings usually don't take place unless whatever is being negotiated has been settled way ahead of time. So I guess moving a step forward here, uh, is there any indication that, you know, if this deal goes ahead with the artillery shells and the ammunition, how will North Korea actually deliver this artillery to Russia? Is there any way the U.S. and its allies could actually prevent it from taking place? That is indeed a question a lot of people are asking because the uh, devil is always in the detail. And there are some uh, analysts, of course, have cautioned about, uh, you know, not to uh, blow this potential deal out of proportion, given uh, North Korea may only have uh, this one uh, train link to Russia to deliver these uh, artillery shells and rockets. But of course, uh, this trip itself, as Will was saying, is uh, important because it's uh, likely to turn this largely symbolic relationship between Moscow and Pyongyang since the 1990s into something a lot more substantive. Now, standing where I am so far, the Chinese have not officially commented on this meeting, but their media, their state media, has been covering this extensively as well. If you read the comments, which are often a reflection of official viewpoints, given how censored the cyberspace here is, there is a large amount of support and even cheering for this uh, quote-unquote growing alliance between Moscow and uh, Pyongyang. Now, that probably not surprising, given the uh, uh, you know anti-U.S. Anti sentiment here often being fanned by state media and officials as well. And when you think about, John, this is also uh, where China shares the same grievances with Pyongyang and Moscow when it comes to uh, their opposition to this Western-dominated world order and their desire to reshape this, right? And they are, in that sense, natural allies, which is also why China and Russia, both permanent members of the UN Security Council, uh, with veto powers in recent months, have been working together to block U.S.-led efforts to uh, impose and or strengthen and sanctions against North Korea because, Pyong because of Pyongyang's increasing missile testing activities. And all of that is uh, why, you know, this, uh, this kind of united front, if you will, is only going to uh, strengthen. But what China differs from Moscow and Pyongyang, of course, is its economy is a lot more intertwined with uh, that of the West. So that's why Beijing is probably going to strike a more delicate line here. So if and when they do come in, they're probably going to be a rehash out, uh, rehash a lot of the, their old talking points about their neutrality on the war in Ukraine, as well as their support for any nation to pursue an independent foreign policy that includes uh, their opposition to global hegemony. John? Stephen, thank you. Stephen, Stephen Jang, live for us in Beijing. Good to see you. CNN contributor Jill Doherty has spent decades reporting on Russia, the Soviet Union, and Vladimir Putin. She's a former CNN bureau chief in Moscow. She's currently an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. She joins us now this hour from Washington. It's good to see you again. Hey, John. Okay, so here's the Kremlin spokesman, uh, Dmitry Peskov, confirming that North Korea's Kim Jong-un's visit to Russia is on. Here he is. Like with any neighbor, we consider ourselves obligated to establish good, mutually beneficial relations. We will continue to strengthen our friendship. All as the Reuters news agency reported, Putin and Kim's meeting will be a full-scale visit, Kremlin says. And this visit by Kim Jong-un marks a kind of a total reversal in that friendship or relationship between Russia and North Korea. Traditionally, North Korea has been reliant on Moscow and Beijing, but now Putin needs North Korea, needs him badly, and seems we now are in sort of uncharted territory in a way. Well, certainly um, when it comes to ammunition that uh, Russia is using in Ukraine, they have been burning through a lot of ammunition. So they really need more. And where they can get it is from North Korea. Now, these are not you know, sophisticated weapons. It's artillery shells, et cetera, things that the, the uh, North Koreans can manufacture. But they don't have to be very sophisticated. Russia is just pounding Ukraine and using it up, and they simply need more. Yeah, well, with that in mind, here's the assessment from the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff on how North Korean weapons supplied to Russia might impact the war in Ukraine. Here he is. I think they'll get some munitions, but uh, I don't know that they're going to get so much that it'll make a substantive difference. So is, is a bigger concern here long term, what Russia might provide North Korea in return uh, in terms of technology for, say, a nuclear submarine or a spy satellite? Oh, definitely. I mean, the North Koreans really would love to get their hands on high technology that they cannot get because of sanctions. And the Russians could provide that. And especially 
uh, at least experts in the field of uh, nuclear weapons say that would be the most dangerous of all. I mean, they do need, the North Koreans do need high technology for what they want to do now, which is dealing with spy satellites that they would like to build and nuclear submarines, et cetera. They simply can't do it at this stage. Russia could very much help with that. But I think it would get more dangerous if you had Russia supplying uh, let's say, the uh, assistance to North Korea in the fuel for ICBMs, the big missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and, so, and any type of defense uh, against other missiles. That would get pretty uh, dangerous and would be of grave concern to a lot of countries in the world. There is some reporting that the South Korean intelligence believes that Russia would be reluctant to go that far down that road because it could end up posing a threat, a strategic threat at some point in the future to Russia. True. Um, that, that is one of the problems. I mean, this would be a serious step by Russia. The United States obviously is urging nothing be done like this. But, you know, there's also, John, kind of a geopolitical part to this, too, because, you know, you figure... Um, Putin is really now trying to kind of gather his friends, and he doesn't have a whole lot of major company, countries that are friends. He has Iran to get drones, and he has North Korea to get uh, ammunition. But after that, it's really just pulling them together because they are opposed to the West. Well, what's interesting is that the focus for the last face-to-face -face meeting, which was in 2019 between Putin and Kim Jong-un, was all about restarting nuclear talks between Pyongyang and Washington. Here's part of a report from CNN's Matthew Chance at the time. Here he is. I hope this visit will be successful and useful, Kim told Russian state media, and that during negotiations with esteemed President Putin, we can discuss resolving the situation on the Korean Peninsula and developing bilateral relations, he added. Kremlin says talks focused on the nuclear issue have been scheduled for Thursday, but the exact itinerary remains shrouded in secrecy. Yeah. Back then, Putin was putting up this image as a potential mediator, almost an international statement, at least you know, an image. Um, fast forward to this meeting, which is most likely to end in a weapons deal and potentially violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. It's interesting to see how far isolated Russia is now compared to back then, how far Putin has traveled um, in terms of his standing internationally and how these roles have changed from North Korea sort of you know, now being in the driving seat because Putin is so desperate for ammunition. Yes, I mean, it really, I think is shocking. If you look at the difference between that report in 2019 by Matthew and now the role that Putin is playing, it's, it really is shocking. And it just shows that at this point, Putin is willing to do things that he would not have done even a couple of years ago. And it, you can say, looking from the outside, it diminishes him. I think maybe Part of the, um, let's say, rationale behind it would be something that I saw uh, in a quote from Russian TV today, which was, well, uh, you know, the United States is looking at Kim Jong-il, uh, Kim Jong-un, and saying they are afraid. What will he do? So part of it could also be, you know, trying to exploit the fear factor uh, for the West. You know, this is something that Russia has to do. And, and taking the chance that this could be very dangerous. So there's, you know, there are messages, there are dollars or whatever money they're going to use, and there's military weapons, but there's always a message. And that is what Russia is trying to project right now. Yeah. Uh, Jill, thanks so much for being with us. It's so good to have you with us, especially on stories like this. It's, it, it, your insights are very much appreciated. Thank you.